We're honored now to welcome our next keynote speaker, Deputy Director Michael Botticelli. Michael Botticelli was sworn in as Deputy Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy in November 2012. He has more than two decades of experience supporting Americans who have been affected by substance use disorders. Prior to joining the office, Mr. Botticelli served as Director of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, where he successfully expanded innovative and nationally recognized prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery services for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mr. Botticelli has served in a variety of leadership roles for the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. He was also a member of the Advisory Committee for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Center for Substance Abuse Prevention and the National Action Alliance for Prevention. In 2012, he was awarded the Service Award from the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. Mr. Botticelli holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Siena College and a Master of Education degree from St. Lawrence University. He is also in long-term recovery from addiction, celebrating more than 24 years of sobriety. Please help me welcome Deputy Director Michael Botticelli. Well, good morning, everybody. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I hear that this is not your typical winter weather. Hi, David. How are you? It's good to see you. Um, uh, it's really, I think I've been trying to get out to Utah now for about, uh, since I started this job, so if, I'm glad that it finally worked out. And I really want to thank David and every, all of the organizers for having me here today. And, uh, you know, I can't help, you know, I've been doing this work a long time, like many of you have been doing this work a long time. And, and, and I got to tell you, you know, listening to stories like David uh, and Jim's and David's is just so incredibly powerful in terms of the magnitude of, of the work that we have in front of us. And I didn't get to hear Jim's entire talk, but, you know, I, I, I um, am someone who um, lived uh, as a gay man through the HIV AIDS epidemic, and I worked in HIV AIDS services. You know, and if, if anything changed things, it was a bunch of really angry people who said, we're not gonna take it anymore. And we're gonna change things. And that's what this movement, and that's what your jobs are all about. That we really need, you know, I've been doing public health related work for a long time. And uh, you know, one, one of the things that I found is that um, while science and data can move public policy, it's people who move public policy. And it's your stories and stories like David's and Jim's that are really going to change the conversation uh, in this United States. So I'm really uh, pleased to be here today. So, uh, so that's the kind of off the cuff. So I'll give you my, the formal uh, uh, part of this. So I am with the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, and we are a component of the executive office of the president. Um, and we really have kind of two main functions that we uh, set the national drug control strategy for the federal government. And so, you know, like um, uh, uh, many of you at the state level, we try to make sure all of our federal agencies are pulling in the same direction as it relates to our national drug control strategy. Um, and so we also do that by funding, and we look at the funding that each of these agencies have um, and make sure that they are apportioning their dollars to help support the national drug control strategy. Um, so one, uh, this is the, uh, we actually have the new report uh, coming out um, in, a, in a couple months. And, you know, under the Obama administration, you know, we really had a significant shift in how we think about drug policy in the United States. And, you know, I was in Massachusetts as the at the time as the state director. And, you know, the director of our office, uh, Gil Kurlikowski, was a former police chief in uh, Buffalo in Seattle. And I remember when the, when the first strategy under the Obama administration came out, and he said things like, we can't arrest our way out of this problem, that we have to deal with substance use as a public health-related 
disease, that criminal justice does play a role, but we fundamentally have to reshape how we think about folks. And he said, you know, uh, 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 really moving the strategy against, uh, away from a war on drugs approach, because a war on drugs was really about a war on people. Um, and I remember hearing that and thinking, oh my God, this is the Office of National Drug Control Policy? I think I like these guys. Um, and so it's really been a privilege for me um, as a person in recovery to, to join uh, the staff there. So clearly, you know, we look at this as a, a, um, in terms of our main goals, but preventing drug use before it starts. So we know that, you know, uh, this is a disease of early onset, that we know uh, it's economical, and I'll talk a little bit more about each of these areas, that we want to make sure that we expand access to treatment for Americans who struggle with addiction. Um, currently, you know, it's estimated that only about one in 10% of people who, who meet diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder ever get care and treatment for their disorder. One in 10. One in 10. And we pay the price for that. Our criminal justice system pays the price. Our health care system. We as human beings and as parents pay the price uh, for that. Um, and this is where uh, the Affordable Care Act comes in, in terms of the work that we do. Uh, we need to reform our criminal justice system. You know, I think you all know, you know, it's estimated that around 80% of people who are in our jails and prisons are there because of their own substance use disorder. And that we have to make sure that we are treating people, not incarcerating them as a result uh, of their having an addiction. And that we want to make sure that we support American in recovery. Um, that we want to make sure that we have a visible and vocal um, uh, uh, recovery community. You know, I remember, um, and this is, you know, is very personal for me, you know, I remember when I knew that I had a problem with alcohol and I knew that I needed to stop. And I remember thinking to myself, I can't imagine a life without drinking. Um, and that's the importance of having that recovery community, that we want to make sure that people know that there is hope, that there's a life out there uh, for people in recovery. And we also want to make sure that our federal policy and our state policies don't impede people reaching their full potential by discriminatory practices. So part of what we do, we coordinate those federal activities. We have about 112 action items that we ask people to report on, on every six months in terms of where we are. And then we have a number of signature initiatives, meaning these are things of such importance to us that we really feel like we need to pay attention to those. Clearly, the prescription drug uh, misuse issue is uh, uh, incredibly important across the United States, um, and we'll, I'll talk about that. Prevention, making sure that we're dealing with this uh, first and foremost as an issue that can be prevented, as well as drug driving. Look at the impact that drug driving, we've made a significant impact in reducing drunk driving in the United States, but not necessarily drug driving. So prevention, let's start with prevention. So, uh, you know, clearly we know that by and large, this is a disease of early onset, that we know that an earlier a person starts using, the more likely they are to develop a more significant problem later in their life. We also know that it's economical, right? So we know that when we invest um, uh, in prevention dollars, um, that uh, we're saving lots of money down the road. However, part of the challenge, and I think uh, a lot of us who've been doing this work for a long time, know that uh, prevention isn't always sexy. Right? And particularly in fiscal, challenging fiscal environments, prevention stuff is sometimes the first thing uh, to go out the door. So you know, we want to make sure that we're looking at uh, supporting our prevention efforts. And we also know that prevention happens at the local level. So I was just, uh, uh, this morning, uh, uh, got to sit in on the SMART Coalition uh, and really got to hear some of the incredibly sophisticated policy-related work that's happening at the local level. All issues, all drug use issues are local. So what, what, you know, what happens in Salt Lake is different than what happens in Boston or what happens in Washington. And we need to make sure that we're having community solutions for community problems and all of those people are coming to the table. The good news is that you know, our science um, uh, has given us uh, great examples of effective prevention program. You know, it used to be that, um, you know, the prevailing wisdom is that, you know, you get someone in recovery who had the most horrific story you could think of, you'd send them to a school assembly, scare the crap out of kids, and we called that prevention, right? Um, and we know that that's not what uh, works. Um, so, you know, the good news is that we have a, a great um, uh, uh, science-based programs that are effective and sound public policies. 
that prevention. So clearly we know things, so our, our, our experience with tobacco has taught us that kids are especially price sensitive and if, if you raise the price of a pack of cigarettes, consumption goes down. It's been one of our prime strategies in terms of tobacco control. And we also know that the same is true with alcohol, that if you increase the price of alcohol, those people who are most affected, youth, those people who are heavy drinkers, we see significant reductions. So we actually have really good sound practice on uh, um, uh, sound policies in terms of, of prevention related efforts. So I want to talk about a little bit about uh, opioid abuse in the United States. Clearly been a significant issue in terms of the numbers and the millions of people who reported non-medical use of prescription drugs uh, in 2012. I don't have to tell any of you uh, in this room. You know, when you, when you look at new initiates of drugs, approximately one in four people who are using a drug for the first time are using uh, prescription pain medication non-medically, second only to marijuana. Um, you all know, uh, you know, and we heard firsthand the dramatic uh, impact of that has meant in terms of overdoses and death in the United States. A lot of figures here. Um, for me, the way that I talk about this, 100 people in 2010, 100 people in the United States, 100 people in the United States a day were dying of drug-related overdoses. That is astounding to me. We are actually approaching mortality that we haven't seen since the AIDS epidemic in terms of what this means. So clearly we have one of the biggest public health crises on our hands as it relates to prescription drug use uh, and opioid use and overdoses in the United States. And again, we know that that has significant cost consequences for both our criminal justice system and our health care system. You know, many of you have probably seen this slide before. And so drug overdoses are classified by the CDC as poisonings, and that red line is poisonings. And that increase is clearly being driven uh, by drug poisonings. And in, uh, I think it was about 2009, nationally, we saw drug overdoses uh, um, surpassing motor vehicle fatalities as one of the single highest causes of injury death in the United States. That's really astounding. So, you know, I always say, if you're trying to figure out what those sound bites are that can move people, 100 people a day and more people are dying of, of, of drug overdoses than they are of motor vehicle fatalities. You know, unfortunately, uh, Utah, despite its success, still has one of the highest uh, overdose death rates in the United States. Um, and clearly, um, I think, feel heartened by some of the legislative actions that are happening in Utah right now as we speak, um, and some of the things that are happening. I think this chart is really interesting and it's really kind of busy enough, but I'll walk you through it because I think it really helps talk about how we implement strategies, policies, and programs to deal with the prescription drug use issue. And so what this shows is looking at um, uh, the, first, uh, the first bar on the left is shows people who use drugs for the first time, prescription pain medication non-medically for the first time. And that big blue section is uh, 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 people who got them from friends and family, right? So this is where we talk about prescription drugs as an epidemic of the medicine cabinet. So I, I like to say that we as consumers, as medical consumers, have been taught to be medication hoarders, right? So we get a prescription, we'll talk about why you got a prescription uh, in the first place, but you get a prescription uh, for 30 pain medication, you take three and we like to put the uh, 27 in the medicine cabinet for a rainy day to give to our friends and family free of charge, right? It's true, we do it. And so, you know, um, uh, uh, and we know that that's where much of the medication, at least early on, gets diverted from, right? So lots of, I'm sure you've heard lots of anecdotal stories about young kids who are going to open houses uh, and checking people's medicine cabinets and visiting their grandparents, you know, uh, a lot more than they used to, to check out their pain medications. So, so we know that, you know, one of the first things that we need to do is think about how do we get this stuff from being diverted from people's medicine cabinets and, and not giving it away. But then it starts changing, and it changes uh, not dramatically, but it also changes subtly. So as people become more frequent users and then chronic users, they turn to different places to get their medication, right? So we see an increase in doctor shopping, the number of people who go to multiple doctors or multiple pharmacies to get their prescriptions. And we see an increase in, in people who buy their medication um, uh, on the street, through an internet, through the dealer. So that's, that's and, and so I think it charts for us kind of how we think about um, uh, um, implementing uh, a plan around prescription drugs. So in uh, 2011, 
the, our office released our plan uh, to reduce uh, uh, prescription drug abuse, and it really has four main areas. One, focusing on education. Two, on prescription drug monitoring programs. Three is proper disposal, and four is enforcement. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking on each, uh, each of, of those. So education first and foremost. So this is true, and it's not to blame the medical profession, but those in the medical profession, doctors, dentists, nurses, get very, very little training around substance use disorders in general. The General Accounting Office said, you know, it's something like uh, three or four hours of, of training. Uh, to identify substance use disorders. And we really need to increase the capacity within our medical profession, not just around appropriate pain prescribing, but around substance use disorders in general. And I like to use this story to illustrate that, and we probably all have our own stories. When, when I was the director of substance use services in Massachusetts, I had, I had a great dentist. He was really nice. You know, on the intake form, I checked off the box around history of substance use. He knew I was the state director for substance use services. He knew I was in recovery for a long time. And after a dental procedure, he said, Michael, would you like a prescription for Percocets? And I said, Doc, I am not the guy that you should be giving a prescription for Percocets. Wouldn't it have been better if we had a discussion about what my pain plan and how my recovery and my, how my history of having a substance use disorder should affect uh, our prescribing patterns. And it was a teachable moment, but it was also very illustrative of the fact he was an, he's a nice guy. He was a great dentist. He thought he was doing the right thing by not wanting to see me in pain, but he just had no knowledge around substance use disorders or who is at risk and what should be appropriate prescribing. The second is around screening and intervention within primary care settings. So I, the way I like to characterize this is substance use disorders are, is probably the last chronic disease where we have that we let people progress to their most acute condition before we decide to treat them. And think of some of the, our own language in this field, right? People have to hit bottom before, they're, uh, before we're willing to give them help. That's crazy. We don't say to people with heart disease, well, you know what? We'll wait till you have a heart attack before we think you're ready to be treated. And so part of it is what we need to make sure is that we're identifying people who are in their early phases of their disease and keep them from progressing. So we need to make sure that we're doing a good job at screening and intervening with people early in their disease where we know it's easier to treat and easier to deal with. Um, we want to make sure that everybody, communities leaders, parents, law enforcement folks, know the dangers of, of prescription pain medication. I think you all know that when, when, kids, when people, but particularly youth, see things as legal, um, and particularly when they're prescribed by a physician, they think it's safe. How bad can this be because a doc is, is, uh, is authorizing this? So we want, we want to make sure that we're doing it. So what are the federal actions that we're looking at? We are looking at legislation, uh, and I think Utah proudly is one of the very few states, Massachusetts is another one, that actually requires mandatory education for prescribers uh, around these medications. So I really applaud you for the work that you do. Uh, we've been working with the National Institute on Drug Abuse. There's a great online course that uh, prescribers can take, and to date, I think over 60,000 prescribers have taken that uh, course. Um, and we're also working on, and, uh, um, uh, on overdose prevention efforts that we'll talk about in a little bit. So monitoring. You know, this gets back, if you, if you go back to the bars and you look at the number of people, um, particularly uh, uh, chronic users, who are using doctor shopping as a way to get their medication, clearly having a system that alerts uh, prescribers to those people who, are, uh, who might be uh, doctor shopping is really important. So we have been working on a prescription, uh, making sure that every state has a viable prescription drug monitoring program. These are systems. Uh, data systems that uh, um, actually have certain thresholds that provide uh, physicians and other prescribers with that information. But we also want to make sure that these systems are used by by prescribers um, and that they're easy to use by prescribers. I don't think I have to tell any of you, you know, it, you're lucky if you get, what, 15 minutes with your physician when you go and visit. So, you know, we want to make sure that these systems are easy to use. So, so we've been um, working on a number of different areas. Um, we want to make sure that our Veterans Affairs Office um, uh, participates in this program because they actually had language that precluded them from doing it. 
We also want to make sure that these um, uh, programs share information across state lines, right? So uh, I think any of us who are familiar with people who uh, have addictive disorders is they usually will go to great lengths uh, to get their medication. And so we want to make sure that people aren't crossing state lines to a state that doesn't have access to that information. Um, and again, we also want to make sure that these systems are easy to use. So we have been working with SAMHSA and other federal partners to look at good tools to uh, embed prescription drug monitoring data in electronic health records where people get automated reports. So we want to make sure that those systems are used. So, uh, so far, so good. Uh, we uh, basically have 49 states uh, that either have active prescription drug monitoring programs or in the process, with the exception of one big state in the middle, uh, Missouri. So, and we're uh, working on it um, as hard as we can. So, um, clearly, you know, if you go back to our bars, 70% of these people are getting their medications free from family and friends. So, so we want to make sure that we're doing a good job at getting these medications out of the medicine cabinets get, uh, to where they're easily diverted. So we want to make sure that we have easily accessible and environmentally friendly ways of doing that. Don't flush them down the toilet, please, um, in terms of reducing our medication. So uh, um, I think, and many of you here have been uh, working uh, at the local level with uh, the DEA and local law enforcement um, in helping to support drug uh, uh, give back days. Uh, we have our next, DEA has their next one coming up April 26th, and I think we've had uh, seven so far with 3.4 million pounds, 3.4 million pounds of medication that have been returned. So it's really, you know, again, if there's any dispute about uh, our, our, you know, our love for keeping our medications, uh, I think it points to that point. Um, we're also uh, um, hopeful that the DEA will publish their final uh, regulations soon um, so that we can have, uh, you as community folks can have institutionalized drug uh, uh, give back programs and don't have to wait for these uh, um, drug enforcement, uh, 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 drug give back days. So enforcement is the other uh, area that is really important, making sure that law enforcement and prosecutors are, are uh, prosecuting diversion and that states are addressing pill mills and doctor shopping. I was actually just in Orlando, I was just in Florida yesterday, they had their uh, state addiction conference. And so if anybody remember this, Florida had some of the um, most laxed rules around pill mills um, and dispensing. And if there was any indication, and this was actually in one of our plans, um, the attorney general said, I think when, when they looked at, uh, I hope I get this figure right, the top 100 prescribers of pain medication in the United States, that one county in Florida had like 90 of them. And Broward County in Florida had by far more prescription pain, prescription pain medications uh, than anybody uh, in the United States. There was a great documentary called the OxyContin Express. Right, so if you haven't seen it, it's really fascinating in terms of following uh, a, a young man who had an addictive disorder um, in terms of searching uh, in Florida. And so Florida, by addressing some of these issues, were able to dramatically decrease the amount of prescription pain medications that were being dispensed, and as a consequence, were able to reduce opiate-related overdoses in Florida by 42%. So it's really astounding in terms of what these goals can mean. So we've been really supporting uh, that kind of work. Um, you know, clearly Utah, I think, has been doing a, a tremendous amount of work in terms of, of these areas and, you know, um, uh, really was um, at the forefront of this. And I'm, I'm looking at Dave Belt now, and I remember, um, I don't know how many years ago, Dave, but um, it, you know, it was clear that some of us in states that had high overdose rates um, were really committed to this work and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration convened a bunch of states um, to really look at and help support state strategies to do that. And uh, Utah was one of those states. And I, I, I remember being particularly impressed by the fact that they had a, um, uh, their medical examiner came to that and able to share data. So, you know, clearly I think Utah has been uh, out front in terms of some of the work. You know, you started this uh, use only as directed program. Um, I think which has, has substantially uh, uh, helped in terms of both prescribing and overdoses. There's clearly more work to be done, but um, it's been, I think, a really good example of state programs. 
Um, you know, we've also been um, uh, uh, looking at um, FDA action around these medications, around um, uh, schedule changes and labeling changes uh, to make sure that um, uh, there are proper warnings um, and proper prescribing of these medications uh, as, um, um, as far as the FDA recommendations are concerned, as well as trying to ensure that we have abuse deterrent formulations of these medications. I think, you know, we, we are uh, uh, particularly uh, concerned in terms of, of what um, will happen with Zohydro coming on the market as of March 1st and are committed with the FDA to kind of monitor the impact of those. One of the issues that we're particularly paying attention to and I know of particular concern here is uh, this um, uh, increase in heroin use that uh, we are seeing in many parts of the United States and quite honestly with a demographic of, 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 of folks that we haven't historically seen with heroin abuse. And, you know, one of the things that's somewhat concerning to me is, you know, in some, you know, uh, media uh, um, outlets, they're, you know, att attributing this to that we've clamped down on prescription drugs and so we've created a, you know, kind of a heroin epidemic. And, and I think it's far more complex uh, than that, right? So, so those of us who've been doing this work for a work time know that this is a progressive disease and know that people often progress to more significant substances. Um, for, for many, it's a, it's a simple economic equation, right? So as people turn, you know, if you go back to those bars again, as chronic users turn to buying the drugs, buying prescription pain medication is simply much more expensive on the street than it is heroin on the street, right? So, you know, a prescription pain medication is up to a buck a milligram, you know, 40, 50, 60 dollars doesn't take an economist, you know, to basically say, hey, you know, bag of heroin on the street, six, seven dollars, you know, uh, 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 it doesn't take a rocket scientist or very long for people to progress. But also what we're seeing is, is incredibly uh, pure heroin. Um, and so often folks who never thought they would stick a needle in their arm or start, you know, snorting heroin, um, but simply uh, uh, and, and pretty quickly move to, to injection. So, so this is an issue that we are particularly concerned about. Um, and again, you know, we want to make sure that we are implementing um, intervention programs to make sure that we're interrupting that circuit. We want to make sure that we have good treatment for these folks. We want to make sure that we have good, uh, so if you think of intervention, we don't want our prescription monitoring programs to just shut people off from their um, uh, medication. We want to make sure that those are intervention opportunities. We want to make sure that our emergency departments for folks who are coming in for overdoses see those as an intervention opportunity to get and move people into treatment. You know, the other uh, issue that we're seeing as it relates to this um, is also a concomitant increase in viral hepatitis and HIV among this cohort. So how we think about doing screening for HIV and viral hepatitis is really important within our treatment programs, um, as well as some uh, um, uh, other um, uh, intervention opportunities like syringe access um, and like needle exchange programs uh, to make sure that we're decreasing uh, um, the um, uh, infection rate uh, for those folks. So the other area that we've been paying particular attention to is making sure that we have good overdose prevention education. We, you know, we were talking about this this morning. You know, and some some of the criticism that we all hear about overdoses, you know, and preventing people from dying is that, well, geez, aren't we just enabling people? Aren't we just perpetuating drug use? You know, and, and to me, that says a, a couple things. It says that we still have a lot of stigma that we need to deal with because it says that people with addiction, that their lives are not worth saving anyway. The, you, you know, the other thing that it says to me is, geez, would we not give someone who is obese, um, uh, CPR or do uh, uh, use defibrillators because they didn't stick to their diet. Of course not. Of course not. So, so we need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to keep people alive to make sure that they get them, that we can get them into treatment and just keep them alive in general. So we've been doing a lot of work and a lot of public education around overdose prevention efforts. Um, and again, I think we've really been heartened by the number of states um, that are in, uh, in either process or have passed 
um, either Good Samaritan legislation, and so if you're unfamiliar with Good Samaritan legislation, we know that people um, are often reluctant of calling 911 and emergency services to report an overdose. So many states um, have passed that. So I think uh, in Utah um, that uh, uh, your legislature has passed Good Samaritan laws and it's waiting the governor's signature. But we also want to make sure that people have access to the life-saving life -saving medication called naloxone. So naloxone has been used by uh, EMTs and others to revive an overdose. So when you have an overdose, it slows your respiratory system, and it doesn't, and it happens over minutes, right? So we know that there is an intervention opportunity, and we also know that people who overdose don't generally overdose alone. Sometimes they do, but generally not. And we also know that first responders police, fire departments are often first on the scene before EMTs get there. And so there's a really good intervention opportunity um, to make sure that we're training people, um, particularly our first responders, on the use of this medication. If you don't know it, naloxone is pretty harmless, right? So if you give it, it really doesn't have any adverse effect. If you give it to someone who's not, um, uh, uh, who doesn't use opioids, who's not uh, in an overdose, it really has no effect on them. But the good news is that it's tremendously dramatic and impactful in reducing an overdose. So it works almost each and every time in terms of reducing an overdose. Um, when, uh, we've also worked, and this is really a helpful tool if you'd like to take advantage of it, uh, we worked with the American Society of Anesthesiologists to do a really nice, simple, easy to read booklet on how to recognize the signs and symptoms of an overdose and what to do in response for that. So you can um, uh, download that from either our site or, or their site uh, for use. Um, we also worked with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration um, to um, uh, produce an opioid prevention toolkit, and that can be really valuable. I, I want to use an example for this. In, in Massachusetts, um, there's this little town south of Boston called Quincy, Massachusetts. It's not, when, you're from, when you're from Boston, we don't say Quincy. It's Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, and Quincy is a town south of Boston, 60,000 residents, very small town, but incredibly high rates of overdose uh, rates, opioid overdose rates. Um, and through a pilot that we had established at the public health department, we trained the entire Quincy police force, first police force in the country to be trained to carry naloxone. And since 2010, in this town of 60,000, um, have already been able to reverse 2,000, uh, or two, 200, excuse me, overdoses in the little town of Quincy. Um, and, the, and the lieutenant who oversees this program will um, uh, talk about the dramatic impact this has had, not only on their ability to save lives, but now law enforcement is seen as part of the solution and not part of the problem. And he tells the story about how it used to be that they used to turn on their blue lights and, and pull people over, and now people are flashing their lights and pulling the police over because they know that they have naloxone in their vehicles. It's really astounding in what we've been able to do. I want to talk a little bit about medication-assisted treatment. Um, so, so first of all, we have incredibly good medications when combined with behavioral therapies that are really effective for a wide variety of, of issues. Uh, first one is nicotine. So, uh, um, there's, so, so it used to be kind of the common thinking that for people, uh, so uh, I think about 70% of people with substance use disorder smoke, right? And it used to be the prevailing wisdom that t asking or telling people to quit smoking in early recovery was actually going to hinder their early recovery, right? No major changes in your first year. People used to say, like, smoke them if you got them. You know, I think anyone who's been to, uh, used to go to an AA meeting, you know, the defining characteristic was the, you know, blue-gray haze of smoke in 12-step meetings. Um, uh, but what we found was something different, was... One, the vast majority of people who are coming into our treatment programs who smoke want to quit. Um, and what we found out is that actually quitting smoking concurrently with treatment actually supports recovery. Um, and we know that still the vast majority of people who smoke die of smoking-related causes than they do of their substance use disorder. Right, so, um, so uh, one of the things we know is the opportunity to really embed tobacco cessation services within our treatment programs. And the other piece I want to talk about is opioid use disorder medication. And, and I feel like this is one of my personal missions at ONDCP. We have a great deal of um, controversy still 
around the efficacy of medication-assisted treatment, particularly for opioid use disorders. And much of that disagreement and lack of unanimity comes from this treatment community across the United States. And it's really time for it to be over. It's really time for it to be over. These, these are the most effective medications that we have in terms of not only treating opioid use disorders, but also in reducing overdoses. The city of Baltimore found when they uh, expanded methadone and buprenorphine treatment in the city of Baltimore that overdoses went down. Medication-assisted treatment for opioid disorders need to be the standard of care for people with opiate addiction. Again, it needs to be, be combined with behavioral therapies. And we need to make sure that people on medication-assisted treatment have full access to the continuum of care um, that everybody else has access to. I don't know how it's here, but in Massachusetts, I used to have residential programs that had a list of medications next to the phone. And if you were on any one of those, whether it was a mental health medication or an opioid use disorder, the categorical answer was no, we won't admit you. And quite honestly, I think that's unethical and, and illegal in terms of people uh, um, with alcohol, uh, with substance use disorders. And so we actually changed our licensing regulations to say that treatment programs couldn't, couldn't categorically deny people a medication-assisted treatment. We need to make sure that we're all saying the same thing around medication-assisted treatment, that it's a valuable part of our treatment continuum, that people with opioid use disorders need to have the choice uh, to be on them and to stay on them. So uh, expanding treatment. Go back to one in 10 people uh, don't get care for their disease. Um, and, 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 you know, and I know particularly in Utah, the uh, expansion However you choose to define it, whether it's Medicaid expansion or ACA, is uh, of considerable controversy here. I, what, what, here's what I know. One in 10 people, uh, only one in 10 people in the United States get uh, treatment for their disorder. And the lack of insurance is often cited as the biggest, one of the biggest factors of why people um, uh, are not getting appropriate care. So I don't care if it's the affordable, I do care if it's the Affordable Care Act. Um, or it's Medicaid expansion, we have to make sure that we're expanding treatment and treatment opportunities for people with substance use disorders. Those numbers are just abysmal. I think for diabetes, it's about 85% of people with diabetes get treatment. About 10% of people with substance use disorders get treatment. For those with mental health disorders, I don't think it's that much better. I think it's about 30% of people with mental health disorders uh, get treatment. So, so clearly we have opportunities to, you know, to expand the, the work that we do. And that's where your leadership, I think, at the state level becomes really important, that however you choose to do it, making sure we have good and robust benefits for people with substance use disorders become uh, really important. The second piece of this, which I think is really important, is the passage in, of, uh, and particularly the final rules of the, substance, uh, the Mental Health and Substance Abuse Parity Act. So we know the other reason that people don't get treatment is that they might have insurance, but that their insurance doesn't cover substance use disorders or mental health disorder treatment. And so the final rules just came out that basically said to insurers, you cannot treat diseases of the brain differently than diseases of the body. So it's really important that at a state level, you're monitoring insurance compliance with those parity regulations uh, and making sure um, that complaints are uh, given to the appropriate folks at the state level. And that's most often the division of insurance. So, uh, you know, thanks. I'll just kind of uh, uh, go through these quickly just because I think that it's um, important um, to do and I think really in, uh, underscores the work that we're all trying to do. So these are from the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, Principles of Effective Treatment. So we know that no single treatment is appropriate for everyone. There's no silver bullet here. We need to make sure we have many, as many tools in our toolbox um, uh, as we can to make sure we get appropriate care. And again, just like with other, with other diseases like cancer or heart disease, you wanna make sure that we have as many treatments available as possible in case one doesn't work. Um, well, uh, Jim was just talking about this as I was coming in, that we need to make sure that um, individuals with substance use disorders uh, uh, often have uh, other uh, mental health conditions and that we need to treat both. Um, we need to make sure that treatment deals with the multiple needs of that clients have. Um, but you know things like housing and employment, uh, other other diseases like viral hepatitis and HIV. Um, we need to make sure that it, that treatment evolves. You know, one of the things that we're working with our treatment programs is that there's no one size fits all approach, right? So treatment programs need to be tailored to those individual needs. 
We know that medications play an important role, as well as combined with behavioral therapies. Um, we talked about some of these other pieces. We also know that treatment needs to be ready, readily available. I think many of us who've been doing this work for a, a long time, you know, we used, to, we used to measure, again, treatment readiness by, you know, someone needed to call a program every day for three weeks, and then, you know, that was, we determined that those were the folks who kind of warranted admission to the program. But we need to make sure that, uh, you know, we basically get as close to a treatment on demand system as possible. We know that detox alone is not enough. Um, you know, detox is really not treatment. Detox is basically gets people ready, keeps people alive for treatment. So we need to make sure that we have a continuum of care that supports uh, uh, long-term recovery. Um, you know, National Institute of Drug Abuse basically says that about 90 days of treatment are, are really kind of the minimum uh, essential uh, 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 days that people need in order to achieve long-term recovery. Um, and I'll just finish this with marijuana because I know that, again, that that's a big issue here. It's a big issue nationally. And, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, there, there hasn't been a lot of coverage um, in the press or elsewhere of really looking at and understanding marijuana's impact on health. You know, it's, uh, again, I think um, folks are, folks are, are touting, um, you know, uh, uh, the tremendous revenue states have um, here of the, you know, of the medical benefits of, of, of marijuana. Um, but, but we think it's important to make sure that people have the opportunity and understand the impact on health. It's clearly the most commonly uh, used illicit drug in the United States. The most recent Monitoring the Future report shows that actually more teens are smoking marijuana than they are cigarettes. Um, and again, I think this factors in to other data that shows that the perception of risk of marijuana use has dramatically uh, declined over the past uh, number of years. So, you know, unfortunately, many of our youth see uh, smoking tobacco as harmful and don't see smoking marijuana as harmful. Um, I think there hasn't been a tremendous amount of discussion that folks know the addictive properties of marijuana. They think it's a benign drug when we know about one in 10 people who use marijuana go on to develop marijuana dependency. If you look at treatment admissions for our adolescent treatments across the United States, that the vast majority of adolescents in treatment in the United States are there for marijuana dependency. So, uh, you know, uh, tell, tell a parent of a kid who's in treatment for marijuana dependence that marijuana is not harmful, and I think you'll get a different story. Um, we also know that uh, marijuana affects those parts of the brain that are responsible for learning and memory. And so it's no secret uh, or no surprise that long-term use of marijuana when it was started in, in adolescence has resulted in substantial reduction in IQ. Uh, and, and again, I don't think that that's a direction that any of us want to see uh, anybody, but particularly our youth uh, in the United States. Um, so, you know, where, where are we uh, um, with uh, kind of medical marijuana and marijuana legalization? So, uh, it's been the federal government's position for both um, that it does not support um, either medical marijuana or legalization efforts. And, you know, uh, we were talking this morning about medical marijuana and, and the bill uh, here, and no one wants to be hard-hearted. No one wants to basically, you know, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, you know deprive um, um, parents whose kids have seizure disorder from appropriate medication. But we also want to make sure as a federal government, I think it's our responsibility as a federal government, as a state uh, 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 government, that we make sure that those drugs meet the federal standards of medication. Um, you know, I think any of us as consumers have a right to make sure that those medications have been evaluated as effective, that we know what's in them uh, before we do it, and that we have a really robust research agenda. Um, and we're also opposed to legalization. You know, as I said before, you know, it's never been the federal government's priority to lock people up and incarcerate people for using marijuana for personal use. It's not been a priority for us. And we don't want to see people incarcerated who have a substance use disorder. We want to make sure that they get care and treatment. Um, so, you know, we are closely monitoring what's happening in Colorado and Washington. Uh, we had this discussion this morning. We are looking at the eight criteria that the Department of Justice laid out to Colorado and Washington in terms of looking at the implementation. So things like diversion to youth, youth treatment admissions, emergency department mentions, 
drug driving, the movement of marijuana from one state to another, from where it's legal to where it's not illegal. So we're committed to monitoring the impact of, of, of marijuana uh, legalization legislation in Colorado and Washington to make sure that we have a good understanding of the impact that it has. Um, I, uh, um, you know, uh, I had the opportunity last weekend to sit down with uh, Governor Higginlooper from Colorado, who's really concerned and very public, and he said, yeah, I wish Colorado was not first in terms of this experiment, because it, it really is an experiment. And, you know, I, I, I talked to many, many parents across this country, um, many of whom who've, whose kids have died of opiate overdoses, and they, they, they do not get what we're doing, because they, they clearly understand that, um, you know, um, opiate addiction doesn't start with um, uh, heroin, doesn't start with prescription drugs that it usually starts with alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana at a very young age. Um, and it's, it's astounding to me that we have many people energized around the opiate issue um, and simultaneously seem to be going in a different direction with marijuana. I think it's really disheartening. When uh, recent monitoring, the future report came out, they looked at kids who use marijuana in the past year. And they looked at, and they asked another question of, of where did you get your marijuana from? And no surprise, in states that had medical marijuana bills, approximately 40% of those kids who use marijuana got their marijuana from someone who had a recommendation. So if we think regulatory structures are going to prevent uh, diversion to youth, uh, we're crazy. And so all you have to do is look at alcohol, right? So alcohol is, in, well, I won't say it's incredibly well regulated, it's regulated, right? And so where do most of the kids get their alcohol from? It's not from a package store, they're getting it from friends and family. Those are the people who are buying it for them. So despite our regulatory structures, we know that there are going to be uh, diversion to youth. And, and I'll just end at this. For those of us who've been doing uh, public health work for a long time, all you have to do is look at what the alcohol industry and what the tobacco industry have historically used as strategies, right? So they know that it's not the occasional user with tobacco, with alcohol, where they make their money. They want the heavy user, right? So uh, I think 20% of people consume 80% of the alcohol in the United States. So their target is clearly the heavy users. So they have a vested financial interest in making sure that they have those heavy users. The other thing that they've done is always gone after youth, right? So they want loyal customers, they want to get them early. And so they've always targeted youth in terms of the work uh, that they've been able to do. And the third thing that they've done is they've always gone after the most vulnerable communities. Right? So it's no surprise that the vast majority of alcohol outlets are in our poor communities of color. It's no surprise um, that tobacco products have been marketed to people of color. Um, so if we think that the marijuana industry is not going to rip those pages from the tobacco and alcohol playbooks, we're sorely mistaken. So you know, I, clearly we have to uh, make sure that we're not disproportionately incarcerating people because of the color of their skin, and that's been a priority for this administration. But, you know, but to think that we're gonna solve our problem by legalizing marijuana uh, is not the direction we, as a federal government, think that we need to move in. So uh, with that, I think I'm probably over time since I love to talk about this stuff. I really wanna thank the organizers for having me here today. Um, I, it's really my pleasure to be in Utah. You um, really have you know, some great committed folks at the community level, at the county level, at the state level. I look forward to hearing about all your great work and how we continue to be supportive of the great things that are happening in Utah. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So, uh, so I think we do have some time for some questions. I've got one first. Okay, go ahead. Um, has there been any discussion of asking or requiring the drug companies to support, in terms of funding, some of these efforts? I know with tobacco, a big part of the, the, the education outreach is funded by the tobacco company. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we generally can't do that as federal government um, because I, uh, it can be seen, quite honestly, as um, kind of strong-arming okay. companies to do that. But I, but, but I know that um, drug companies will, will often support um, uh, uh, local efforts uh, uh, around that. So it's just um, we as um, kind of federal authorities who have some level of authority over them uh, usually can't do that.
Yeah, and, and you know, I'm from, I talk fast, you know, so. Do you have a Red Sox hat on? Okay, thank you. In the back? So, so it's a good question in terms, so um, many of you know Patrick Kennedy, uh, who's been a really big proponent of mental health and substance use disorders. Uh, and I love the phrase that he uses. And he says, we need a, a checkup from the neck up, right? Which I think is what you're getting after. And, and I think in some respects, that's the impetus behind looking at things like screening and assessment within a wide variety of primary care settings. So that it is kind of part of the normal routine of medical care. Um, you know, the other thing, and we were talking this morning, uh, you know, the, the way historically mental health and substance use to service, services have been treated over here and primary care services over here. And the way that I talk about that is if you take out your insurance card, I, hopefully you have one, it'll say, here's the number to call for primary care. But if you have a mental health or substance use disorder, call this number over here. And, and so we've had these two separate systems of care for a very long time. And so part of it is both clinically and structurally, I think we have to make sure that we have this kind of integrated care. And part of the way many states, and I think Utah is looking at this, is from a contractual perspective that you're not contracting for services in this carve-out mentality, right? So that's how we talk about it, that you're not carving out mental health and substance use disorders over here and primary care over here. So I think both from a clinical and structural perspective, we have to continue to look at ways to integrate care. Yeah, uh, so the question was, and I'm sorry to repeat it, uh, uh, copies of the PowerPoint. So we'll make sure that we get that and uh, get that out to folks. Up over here. So, uh, so two questions. Uh, one, and hopefully I'll get these right. One, why, why, why aren't we expanding kind of the pool of people who are authorized and or training um, folks uh, around those medications? And um, I think um, your question is, and I'm, I was probably a little uh, short, uh, sometimes I'll just say physicians as shorthand for a wide variety of medical professionals. And a lot of the training actually is geared toward pharmacists in terms of, and pharmacists actually play a unique role in this. Um, and they do have an obligation, quite honestly, that if they suspect um, that someone might be doctor shopping or that the prescription might be uh, um, uh, uh, less than legitimate, to not fill that prescription. So pharmacists actually do play a unique role in terms of this work. Um, usually the role that a pharmacist plays is under the state medical uh, board or the state pharmacy board. So, so it plays out differently in different states. The, the second piece, and I think the answer to your question is, how can we incentivize people to get back, to give back those medications that we believe um, most uh, uh, addictive? And you know, I'll, let me check. I don't know if the regulations speak to that. I, th I think what um, we want to 
to do, and clearly those take back days are directed at those medications. Um, but I, I don't think there's any special provisions or preclusions um, based on what kind of medication it is. But we can take a look at that. Good. Great. One more? One more, and then we'll. So, so a couple things. So um, the information that I talked about, and, I, and you'll have to check me on my mental health figures because I don't know those. So, so the figures that I'm quoting come from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, right? And uh, many of us have seen kind of the nice pie that it looks at. So, so part of what we know is some people recover on their own, right? Don't go to treatment. They might go to 12-step groups. They might not do that. But, but we still know that there's a significant number of those who need treatment at a specialty facility. And when they ask people who, uh, of those who didn't get care and who were seeking care why they didn't get it, that's where that figure comes from around insurance and lack of insurance status, right? So, so those are really, I think, helpful uh, statistics to, to look at. The second part of your question is, um, and there are folks at the state level who I know know this, um, is the, the um, uh, Health and Human Services just issued their final regulations on the Mental Health and Substance Use Parity Act. And I know that there's still lots of questions about it, but the, but the basic framework is that people who have coverage for those disorders, an insurance company has to prove that things like co-pays and deductibles lengths of stay, authorization requirements for mental health and substance use services are no different than they are for medical illnesses, right? So it's important that for, if you're a parent, if you're um, uh, uh, someone who has employer-sponsored in, in insurance, that if you think there's some discriminatory practice that's happening, that you're not getting access to a medication or you're not getting a length of stay as you would if it was a medical disorder, that that information um, gets to the division of insurance. And usually there's an appeal process that you can utilize with insurance companies. So, you know, it might be important, um, and I don't know, I think there's, I know that there's some information at the federal level um, that talks about parity. Um, but it's a really important thing for people to monitor, and usually that monitoring is here at the state level. Last question, and then we'll go. I was thinking about um, the insurance in Florida, like the Are the primary care physicians? So, um, it depends. <laughs> it's, You know, again, I, I, the whole point of prescription drug monitoring programs is that, um, uh, regardless of who the regardless of who the prescribers are, um, that they're supposed to be entering that information in the prescription drug monitoring programs, so that you can see kind of where people are getting their prescriptions and where they're getting their medications. So I'm not, you know, I'm not fluent in kind of the exact language here in Utah are the exact requirements of the prescription drug monitoring programs, but the whole point of those programs is so that every prescriber and dispenser has access to that information to ensure that people aren't going to multiple places to get multiple prescriptions. Um, uh, that, that usually varies by state. Right, so uh, I think what we're trying to do is is basically not uh, have a, a penalty, but we've been actually trying to look at ways that um, uh, prescribers are particularly mandated or encouraged uh, to sign up. So, and again, that those those are usually under the jurisdiction. Um, prescription drug monitoring programs are usually under the responsibility of the state. Uh, to do that, but I think uh, many states have been working to make, uh, to incentivize people to um, uh, both one get the medical education and two make sure the information gets appropriately entered. So, thank you, everybody. It's really been a pleasure to be here today.